Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 215 of Dial the Gate, the Stargate Oral History Project. My name is David Reed. Appreciate you joining me on a Friday. Uh, Dan Shea, Sergeant Siler, and stunt coordinator for Stargate SG-1 is joining us for this episode. Going to share some more uh, stories from uh, uh, the set and talking about what he's doing now. And maybe he's brought in a certain wrench along. We're going to have to wait and see. Before we get started, if you enjoy Stargate and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, click that like button. It makes a difference and will help the show continue to grow. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to be not notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. And giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment the new video drops. And you'll get my notifications of any last-minute guest changes. And clips from this live stream will, will be released over the course of the next few weeks on the Dial the Gate and GateWorld.net YouTube channels. As this is a live show, my moderators, Anthony and Summer, are standing by in the uh, YouTube chat where we basically have a party every episode, and you can submit questions to Dan. Dan will, uh, The moderators will get the questions over to me, and I'll get them over to him. But in the meantime, he's all mine. Mr. Dan Shea, stunt coordinator extraordinaire, Sergeant Siler, welcome back to uh dial the gates or how the heck are you doing these days i'm doing quite lovely young david thanks for asking <laughs> you forgot to mention uh richard dean anderson's handsome stunt double that's too. absolutely mm -hmm. right richard dean anderson i think, I think stunt you did that double. on purpose because you know that i rick always knows that i'm a threat so i always wondered why he had like three hit series and i had none uh i mean the is he that much more handsome than me i i, I don't think so personally but i don't he is think quite so either but you know that's that's the way that goes Absolutely. So, and he what? always had a problem. Now, my baby finger, whenever I held on to a P90 when I was doubling for him on Stargate, he would say, keep that pinky on your right hand down because I always had it up. And he said it looked stupid. But now I broke my finger uh, on a show called uh, uh, Animal Control, a comedy on Fox. And so now the thing sticks out all the time. And now when I'm on my computer, I hate being on the computer anyways. And that stupid finger always drags along and touches stuff oh, on the keyboard. And, and it, it uh, like, I'm kind of a non-digital uh, dope to begin with. And then once <laughs> things start getting weird because of that baby finger, then I get in a little bit of trouble. So, well, uh, yeah. You know, you, you would you would never know, but the, the the bumps and bruises that you had to put up with over the years was was absolutely wild. Anyone who is is willing to go through that punishment for. Um, for posterity, for for entertainment, you and know. money. What about the money? Don't forget the large all. Absolutely, that green, those green backs. But uh, my one of my favorite lines from the entire show is is yours in two hundred. Do you remember the line? Uh, why does it always happen to me? <laughs> no, right. no, no. That was that two hundred. Uh, that was two hundred. When I got ratcheted into the wall. That's it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and it man. happens to me because I'm kind of like a stunt guy. And that's <laughs> that's the, exactly uh, right. That was the subtext. Road to Christmas with uh, Martin Wood you're working on right now? Yeah, it's a Hallmark show here. Uh, it's a, a little uh, love story thing. Uh, uh, we're just kind of piddling away on it. It's it's kind of going to be kind of fun. There's not a whole lot of action on it. There's some actor action where you have to sort of babysit the actors and keep them safe. A little bit of driving and and uh, going through an obstacle course and um, oh, they're on a mechanical reindeer. So that should be kind of, <laughs> wow. that, that, that should be, that, that should be fun. You know, wow. people flying all over the place. So yeah, we're, we're kind of uh, working on that. I'm waiting for a couple of shows to come back for season two. Uh, so help me Todd and CBS is doing quite well. So we're waiting for season two of that. And then, as I mentioned, animal control, uh on fox is hilarious in my opinion and that uh, we're waiting for that one to come back we had um on that show we we had a 15 foot uh python wrapped around a stuntman's neck the idea was that it was supposed to be terry metcalf from the seahawks and uh and he had a pet snake and it uh accidentally wrapped around his neck so we we couldn't get him so we got a a local stunt uh guy uh, former professional football player, but three or four of the stunt guys. Now, Gaston Morrison, uh, you might be familiar with him. He he doubled uh, uh, um, Dulé Hill, the lead on Psych, and he's a he's a pretty uh, well known. And he he did he did some Stargates. Uh, him and a couple other guys wouldn't even audition for it because they didn't want a 15 foot uh, boa constrictor 
wrapped around their neck, if you can believe that. So we we actually had the actor do it, do it, and um, oh no, they well he's a stunt actor, and uh, it, it uh, worked out. It, it was pretty pretty funny. And after a while, first of all, we're petrified by the snake. And an hour and a half into it, we all wanted to get a picture. We wanted to get that Britney Spears shot, not wrapped around our neck, but just kind of around our shoulders. And uh, so it was uh, it was fun. And actually, the lead on the show took the snake down to L.A. On, and put it on. Uh, he was on Jimmy Kimmel. He had it wrapped around his neck as kind of promo for the show. How do you so. get a snake to do that without killing someone? Well, we have the two uh, snake wranglers are just slightly off camera. They're within arm's length. Uh-huh. And amazingly, the snake doesn't really do anything. Like you would think, well, all of a sudden, what if he starts to tighten up? Right. Because because that would be their instinct. It is not what they want to do to right. to wrap to around eat. your neck, and then they 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 kind of suffocate you, and all of a sudden the head comes around and starts you know working over your head, and before you know it, it's the most horrific death one could even imagine as he as you become just a big lump in the belly of a snake, and uh, that 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 to me. Oh, that that would be a horrific way to go. And I I don't want to get too weird here, but it it harkens back to this uh, news thing that I heard about uh, 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 a family that lived above. This isn't funny. Stop smirking. A family lived above a pet shop. And in this pet shop, there was this huge boa constrictor that went up through the rafters, through the air duct into a baby uh, room. And I'll I'll just leave it at that. I think I remember this story. So nasty. So that's Nasty wild. Business. How, how often do you come across something on the page that gives your team or the people that you're going to get involved uh, with to achieve what's on the page pause? Uh, uh, where, every, was there any instance? Every minute, in, every day, in a, every second. Really? I mean, Carl Weathers, Carl Weathers uh, uh, from Apollo Creed, he he did a show called Street Justice years ago. And he's just like a stud, 6'2", 215, totally athletic. And on Street Justice, he told all of us, I get my stunt double. Turns out it was Johnny Ulmer who doubled Chris Judge on Stargate mm. uh, to do everything. And he said, even if I'm jumping off an apple box, I can break my ankle. Yeah, uh, of course. So, uh, so tons of things can go wrong at any time. So that that's why you want stunt people doing it who are sort of in that neighborhood and uh, – have the skill set and and the emotional um, preparedness to handle all things that could go wrong. And if something does go wrong, uh, we don't want stunt people to get hurt. But if they do get hurt, then we can just get another one. Uh, and continue you know, working. Yeah. You cannot replace the actor because their face is on camera. So that, that's one of the reasons why another one of the reasons why we need stunt people. Can I get technical for a second? Please do. Uh, can you tell us about the ins- the special insurance that's involved for them? I'm curious. Uh, we, we don't really, we have our, our union, we have the SAG union, we have the yeah. UBCP union. And uh, uh, I don't think we have any special insurance. Uh, we, we, we're we insured through the union. Okay. But I don't think it's some magical stunt thing because you're a stunt guy. You're, you're you know, uh, I, I think I think the show was covered anyways. I see. Uh, so it's underneath the overall umbrella of the production. It's the umbrella of the of the show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We don't we don't have a special stunt guy in, in life insurance. Well, you couldn't you couldn't get it. I mean, you say, well, what do you want insurance for? Oh, I'm a stunt guy. I'm going to set myself on fire tomorrow. And they'll, yeah. they'll be like, uh yeah, no, sorry. You don't get life insurance. It's it's a wild any anything can happen. I mean, Daniel Radcliffe stunt double on Harry Potter. You know? The boy died. Something, I missed that. What happened there? Uh how did he die? Oh, maybe, I didn't know he died. Maybe Ooh, maybe sorry. he died after, but he was definitely injured heavily during production. Ooh. And there was that stunt woman from LA too. She was incredible, incredible motorcycle girl, and she was just blasting. Yeah, like about 100, 120 miles an hour, and there is the camera on a like a, on a ultimate arm, you know, and, and I guess it swung across and hit her, and uh, that's gosh, oh she, geez, gosh, she lost, she, she, I think she lost an arm and a leg. Ooh, that was that was awful. Yeah, there was it was a flying sequence. Uh, he wasn't killed. I don't believe he was killed. Um, uh, no, he wasn't killed during production, but he sustained an injury during one of the 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 uh, the flying sequences. He he lost feeling across his whole body from his finger trips down to his po- toes. The injury changed him and had long lasting effects that uh, that, that plagued him for the the rest of his 
his life. Uh, I, you know what? I, I better correct myself on this before I proceed. He's not dead. I apologize. He hasn't died, but he is. But he is a paraplegic. Um, and that's the the risk that you take when you go out there. You know, you're um. Uh, I guess, I guess they know what they're. I guess you know what you're getting in for. That anything is possible, and that's, you've got to be prepared. That's to be the idea. You, you don't want anything to happen to you. But there's a there's one guy uh, who um, was doing a snow thing. He launched off and uh, hadn't checked the snow depth. Hit a rock, and he's also a quad, but an incomplete quad. But he uh, oh, man. he swims down at Kitt's pool. Uh, four times a week with, with me, like, and I'm thinking. At first, I'm like, "How do you swim?" But he has kind of partial use of both of his arms, and he's kind of swims on a side, and he does a bunch of lengths. He's, you know, he's better swimmer than me, and and he gets in his car and he drives to the pool and he parks. He goes there like every day, and he's upbeat. Uh, and wow, I mean, this this guy, you know, you look at people just, like that, and. You you wonder if how you can ever have the will to complain about anything. Yeah, well, I mean, I whine about the SAG strike and the writer strike. You figure well, we we got through COVID, and we thought our movie is going to come back ever. They're probably not going to come back, and they came back in a huge way. We had Raiders, we had Mission Impossible, and then we had uh, 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 Barbenheimer that weekend. That yep. Tom Cruise said, "I'm going to go watch both," and that day it became a thing. Yep. And it, and Barbie's made over a billion bucks. Yep. And, uh, and so we, and so what do they do? They go on strike. So, but whatever, what can you do? Yeah. Um, uh, who was it? Rob Fournier went by bridge yeah. studios the other day. Yeah. Four or five people four four or five cars in the parking lot. Yeah. It's just, it's maddening. Yeah. Pulls your hair out. Yeah. yeah. It's nasty. So, but, but hopefully it'll be resolved. But, ab oh yeah, yeah, that's absolutely. It's just a, it's just a question of, of when. So you're working with Martin Wood. Any, any other uh, Stargate folks on that project? Uh, no. Okay. Not, not, not Stargate folks. No. Okay. No, that, that. And Mechanical Reindeer. Mechanic. I'm not sure. Am I allowed to talk about script before something even shot? Maybe we should. Probably not. Movie. But that yeah, still sounds not. cool. So yeah, I'm trying yeah, to get yeah. Martin on the show. So maybe he can. Yeah. expound further but um yeah. dan i'm curious uh as to the process that you would have for going through a specific stargate script first of all was it different uh or unique in any respects to any of the other content that you've worked on but can you take me through the process of uh, what you would have to do to prepare and execute what was on the page how many weeks in advance um, would you get the script? How would you prepare? What's the process that you would go through, if you don't mind, from beginning to end? Episodic. We'd have about a week and a half prep and an eight-day shoot. You get the script. You read the script. You start highlighting the script, all the stunts and all the actor action beats. And then there's an ND sequence where you have a bunch of Jaffa running around or something getting blown up. How many do you think we should uh, try and get for this? And and should we make it cool? Is it enough for them just to jump off an alpha box? We've seen Jaffa running and flying and blowing up before. Are they going to get bored if we just have them fall over? Or should we put them on wires? And how do you have the wire? Do we need to bring in a huge crane that costs uh, 50 grand? Or should we? are there big trees there? Maybe we can convince Martin Wood or Peter Delaware. Let's have the action over by the trees. And we can put pick points up in the trees. And then we can have it come down to a... Uh, ratchet, which has a uh, thousand pounds per square inch of of oxygen in, or, uh, in, in the machine that can propel people, you know, through the air as quick as humanly possible. You can yank them so hard their boots would fall off. And do we want to have them fall off camera onto a pad? Do we want to have Ray Douglas set up some flames up the rear end so it looks kind of cool as they're blasting away? So then we'll need fire retardant gel to put on their face. And yeah. so these are just conceptual things that you would go through during the um, uh, concept meeting, which be, would be the first meeting. So you you then put together your uh, uh, preliminary stunt budget, and then you got to be careful. Now, are, are they whining about money these days, or are the ratings high? Should I go big or should I go small? Uh, if you go a little bit big, ask for 10, then maybe you can get away with eight stunt people. Yeah. And, and so then you do your preliminary budget. No one whines about the numbers. So then you figure, oh, great. So then you'll start thinking about hiring people. Uh, then you start sending the pictures of the people to the directors. What do you think of this 
person. Uh, like we, oh, we've hired Ronnie Robinson too many times. He's six foot four, 235. He's great, but we saw him last season. I want to talk briefly about a Ronnie Robinson anecdote later as yes, I wrap up the original it question. Up. It's a Peter DeLuise and uh, Ronnie Robinson uh, story. And so now you do the concept meeting, you discuss, 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 discuss. Then you have your specific stunt meeting where you go into details uh, about it. How are we going to make it look cool? How are we going to make it safe? Then you have the tech survey. So then you physically, uh, everyone gets on the happy bus and you go around to all the different locations and, and you discuss exactly what you're going to be doing. So the Stargate is going to be over there and, and people are going to be coming up over the hill. It'd be kind of cool to have a guy being shot and roll down the hill. And, and, you know, things might pop into your head that are uh, location uh, specific that you hadn't thought of before. And you run it past the director and they say, no, you're an idiot. Or they go, oh, God, that's kind of a cool idea. And that's the other thing, too. Uh, if, if, if directors are kind of uh, not very pleasant, you, you tend not to want to give ideas because they make you look like an idiot. But, but our guys like Martin Wood and Deloise, they were hilarious. And so they would encourage you even to give the stupidest ideas. And I can't always come up with a, little, with a lot of stupid ideas. <laughs> so now we've got the tech survey. We've got that scoped in. And, and then, so now we're, we're pretty much locked. And then we start actually hiring the people. And, and then the people then uh, go for their wardrobe fittings and they go for their hair, hair haircuts and, 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 uh, and so on. And then we get the schedule. And then the, we hire everybody and then the schedule changes 13,000 times. So the 10, 15, 30 people that you hire are now no longer available because they're going to work on the Will Smith iRobot thing, which is huge and it's uh, more yeah. money and it's cooler. And it's a, a 135 buyout for the actors to be on camera instead of a 110. You know, with buyouts, you they can use your image for years and not have to pay your residuals. Whereas in SAG, there's no buyout. So you 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 have you get residuals right away, but you don't get double your salary up front like we do here at UBCP. Uh, and, and so they love features because you make more money in features. So then you got to hire 10 more people. Then the wardrobe people are like, what? We fitted all these guys. You know, now we got to fit a bunch of other guys. What's going on? Not my fault. Oh, this guy's got a tattoo. We got to bring in someone else uh, three hours earlier to... Uh, get rid of the tattoo and I'm going to complain to the PM that the stunts are, are causing all these budgets alerts. And then this guy's got bleached hair. So, you know, Jaffa and, uh, I remember uh, that got, specific actor with bleached hair. Yeah, they don't, they, they don't have, they can't have it. So, but, or they specifically want it. We had Glenn Ennis and uh, Michael, um, can't think of Michael's name at the moment. They were huge blonde haired guys. Mm -hmm. They're six foot four. And then Glenn Ennis now as an aside, was a Jaffa and um, he doubled, um, oh gosh, who's the biggest guy in Hollywood now? Who's Aquaman? He doubled him on Atlantis. Oh, Jason Momoa. You know Jason, you know Jason. Yeah. But now Glenn, Glenn and then Ken Kersinger, who is a, uh, a stunt Jaffa commander, stunt actor, are going somewhere this weekend for a convention. You must, maybe you're probably familiar with it because they played Jason uh, in a bunch of movies. So there, there's some convention somewhere in your great country where these two buddies of mine, both six four, six five, one two seventy. Are going uh, uh, for a companion, Brad Lurie also, and because they play Jason. And mm -hmm. Glenn did a little video on YouTube today where he's putting all this Jason masks in a suitcase, packing <laughs> to go for his little little convention. Uh, and then uh, and then you get all the new people, and and then you're about to shoot, and then as you're about to blow stuff off, they send you another script, and you start uh, you know prepping as you're on set. Uh, and you, you repeat it all over again, but now it's overlapping because now you're shooting the one episode and prepping the next. And, uh, uh, you know, that, that was the fun part. Now, when the WB uh, stunt shows came, the stunt coordinator named J.J. Mackerel came up with this miraculous idea of let's having a, a stunt coordinator and a dedicated fight choreographer and yeah. a dedicated budget guy and a de de dedicated uh, uh, tech survey guy and that cost a ton of money, but their their formula worked because so that that begot Superman and Legends and Arrow and Flash and back but back in my day, I was the idiot who did everything, wow. and and so uh, and still do because I kind of like the and then then you throw in COVID, yeah. But then it's like the schedule changes and everyone's been tested, and and now you know we we got to get a whole bunch more and, and we got to get them tested. And when I was doing uh, animal control and we'd actually. Uh, done the fight choreography. We we did the previs. Previs when you shoot the video and you cut it and you you show it to the grown ups and get them to sign off on it. So we're all, all dialed in. 
And then everybody went to Whistler to see the stunt person, uh, Marnie Yang's incredible movie there at the film festival. And they were partying and drinking and hugging. And then uh, they all got COVID. All got it. So now all my fighters have got COVID. And now I got to bring in five new people on Monday to work on Tuesday. So I bring them all in. And we're, we're doing the PCR test, which takes seven hours. They're all positive. So then I got to bring in seven more. And it's at night. And their call time's 5 a.m. the next morning. And so then I just bring in 10. I say, the, the people who don't test positive, you're working. And uh, yeah. so we got through. And we, we did a nice fight on another show called Animal Control and not not Stargate, but still uh, a, a funny show. And so so that that's another thing, the whole COVID thing. And then when we got to the end of another show that I was working on, we, we uh, Animal Control. So help me, Todd. And this other show called Under the Bridge. It's a story about a, 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 a Southern, South Asian 15-year-old girl from Victoria. You know, Vancouver Island is Victoria. Mm-hmm. 15 years ago, she got beat up and drowned by, by a bunch of 15-year-old girls. And we, we that, that, that was, uh, but we, we got to the end of that. And in the last month of that show, we didn't have to do COVID t- tests. No testing, no masks, no nothing. And it was, it was, uh, it was heaven. So, uh, so, and I was rambling, sort of the ramble. And, and the lead on that show, she's incredible. Her mother uh, was Lisa Marie Presley. So she died uh, four months ago. So we were on hiatus for a month. Uh, and I forget the lead's name. She's incredibly talented, but uh, that was under the bridge. Uh, you can knock it off. You, you, I see you typing it in. You're going to get it. And she's done a bunch of stuff. And she's really, Riley really talented. Keough. That's it. Danielle That's Riley Keough. Wow. Riley Keough. Man, it's. Did I ramble? Did I answer your question? Seems like yeah, an hour and large, a half. So yeah, so you would get to the day. You would you would get the the people that you had. Um, would you, would the stunt business end when production ended? Would would you be brought in at all in post for anything? No, not no post for me. Okay. We there would be second unit cleanup. We would do all yes. the stuff with the uh, with the actors, and we'd have to think. Okay, what's going to be in the background of the shot of Chris Judge? We got some stunt people flying off of what's called air rams. Where they, you know, pound per square inch, just like a little plat, little uh, thing, a little diving board thing. You step on, and it projects you through the air. And so then we'd have to remember a second unit where everybody was doing their business, and we would recreate that, and, and we would do close-ups of them doing their action shtick uh, because they want to get all the stuff for the actors because they needed to be in the next scene for the next day's work. Uh, whereas the stunt people, we, we, you know, they weren't locked in, so we could take two days of second unit just to knock off tons of people getting shot and blown up and burnt and, you know, thrown into walls and kicked in the crotch and so on. <laughs> G- oh, Ronnie General Robinson, Tom Fullery. So, so, Ronnie, so Robinson Ronnie Robinson and Peter Deloise. He was a six foot five, 260 pound Jaffa. He's hilarious. He was an ex uh, professional ball player, played for the Detroit Lions. And then he came here wow. and played for our BC Lions it's in the CFL. And he he had this uh, uh, Jaffa thing on his forehead. And a, very, a lot of them had, they're really intricate. You know, those things that, what was the, the tattoos? Not, what oh, the, 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 gold, the, the gold ones? Not the gold ones, the different, but whatever, whatever that The word black is. ones. Yeah, the, the, the first prime. Tattoos, yeah, the, yeah. the system lord uh, symbols. That's right. But I'm just thinking the words, not a tattoo, whatever. So, he, so Ronnie Robinson had it, and it took like an hour to put this on him. And he, he had his close up. And then we went to lunch, and Ronnie had a little sleep. And then we came back after lunch. And then Peter DeLuise was shooting his stuff, and he did his close up of Ronnie. And all of a sudden, the, the script person said, Hey, where's his tattoo? Where's uh, his emblem? Where's the thing on his forehead? And then Peter DeLuise was like, What? And sure enough, Ronnie's thing was no longer there. And we're like, what the hell? Because he he we had just shot him with it, and now we shot it without him for like an hour. What's going what's up? So then so then Peter took Ronnie off to the side and he said, Ronnie, it's like when you're talking to your kid, like, don't lie. Like, I won't get mad, but just tell me what the hell happened to your thing. And then Ronnie said, Well, I was sleeping, and then I may have like put my hand on him and 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 so uh well, I don't think I did but, but Peter said I won't get mad Ronnie just please tell me the truth and I think that I think what happened was Ronnie fell asleep and he was all sweaty he's six five you know uh two six you were in the stuff and he, he was sleeping and he wiped the whole thing off oh and no. then he had to go back and take, take an hour to put the thing back on again and go shoot a bunch of other crap 
And uh, so that was the little Ronnie Robinson incident. But what, what we all love is how Peter Deloise took him to the side and said, and, and Peter's quite big. He's like 6'2 himself, yeah. but Ronnie's like 6'5. And, you know, and he's going like, okay, we're not going to get mad. <laughs> but please, please don't lie. Not that Ronnie would lie, but what happened to that emblem? Anyways. Sorry. My gosh, it's little things Family. like that. There's one episode early on. I think it's the enemy within. I think it's the episode right after the pilot where Teal's uh, uh, serpent um, tattoo is upside down. You know, oh. and <laughs> Didn't know that. yeah, go back and watch enemy within. And it's like, wow. uh, oh, yeah, no, no. And yeah. you just, you know what? You, you catch as much as you can and you move forward. So yeah, the air rams. I'm curious. Um, oh. Would those activate when he jump when when the Jaffa would approach it? It would fit. Would it physically feel him and then jump foot, it, or is there a button that you're timing it. it with? When your when when your foot touched it, it would go. The 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 buttons you're referring to were squibs. Okay. Uh, the effects guys would have squibs where stuff would blow up, and they'd have to time it. Okay. Uh, oh God, let me let me do you a quick uh, a squib story. There's another show, sorry, not story yet, where we were up in this okay. big, huge tower uh, on a cliff. What are those things called where, where the ships are coming in and they got the lights and they're the lights? It's called the lighthouses. Lighthouse. So we had yeah. this guy named JJ Macro, who I mentioned earlier. He was a high fall specialist. And he had the, his, his gag was to run. He's at the very top of this lighthouse, run towards the, the glass, the hard glass. Mm -hmm. And just as he launched himself, they were supposed to blow the glass and he was supposed to go out and drop like 150 feet onto an airbag. So he had to be running as fast as he could to dive out through this glass. So take one, okay, go running, 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 running. Just as he's going there, the, the effects guy is just lined up with the glass and he presses the button and the button doesn't go. And JG Macro goes, Boom, into the thing and like a little fly or a bee on a windshield kind of falls down like this. And it was like, holy crap, take two. He's got to do it again, but he's got to run just as fast at that plexiglass. And, and he has to pray to someone that this time it actually will did go. Did they figure out what's wrong before between take one and take well, two? hopefully. Or just yeah, going to try did. it again? They they were, yeah, they were like, you know, uh, 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 hmm, I think it was the doohickey that didn't go. Okay, oh, the doohickey. The damn doohickey. Great. But the thing is, if he doesn't get out far enough, yeah. he's going to die. Because you know how lighthouses kind of come out a little bit? He yeah, you have to get, get past the lip of the, of the, That's the correct. top level. He's got to get out like at least eight feet to get to his airbag. But can you imagine what goes on inside your head when you're on take two? You're running. It's like running towards a brick wall. And please, uh, you know, blow this thing this time. And don't blow it too soon because then then he blows all the glass into your eyes, right? Because you got to look and see where your mark is. And, and, and if they blow it too soon, it blows up in your face. And also, it, the timing's wrong. The, uh, the audience can see, right. like, it's supposed to be you breaking it. And if it blows before you get there, then I got it. We got to do it again. So when he was on take two, they nailed it and he dropped 150 or whatever. No, maybe 70 feet onto his airbag. So uh, now what, what can was I, like? Can I ask that? about that? Yeah. Why not use candy glass? Why not let uh, him break no, it? Candy, candy glass isn't quite as good. It, it, it's it, it clearly, it, it's like disintegrates. It's, it, it, uh, it's, it, it doesn't look as cool as tempered glass. Tempered glass wow. is the real thing, but it's also uh, kind of real dangerous. Um, okay. I did one of those things too when I had to dive through. It was a similar thing, but but it, they were a bit late, and my I still have the knuckle here from it, where wow. where, I, where I hit the thing and it didn't break, but then my hands went like this, and then it broke, and then I went through. It, was now, this Stargate? My, no, sorry, it's okay. for an earlier thing. Okay. Uh, Lou Bolo was a coordinator who you don't know, and I'm just trying to think of the show. It would have been a candle show, but but I just I just dropped ten feet on the pads, not like a hundred feet like the cool people do. But uh, uh, and what was I supposed to answer before I digressed? We were. I was asking about the um about the the air ramps. Oh, the air ramps. Okay, air ramps. So yeah, air ramps. So yeah, so air ramps are are these uh, flat these lids, and then when you run and you your foot touches it it activates and it, it throws you. So they're nasty because if you, if your leg is back like this and it goes, then it throws your legs out in front of you. And then, then the lid comes up and you hit your head. If you're, if, if, if you're not right, the thing comes up and can snap your Achilles. It can snap your leg. There's a guy named Gerald Pates who, who was a Jaffa a few times on Stargate. He just disintegrated his leg from, from an air ram. And also sometimes they're slippery, right? When, when you practice, 
air rams, like you're in a gymnasium and your feet are dry and everything's ideal conditions. But whenever we do stuff for real for on shows like Stargate, it's always raining. It's always it's always night. It's always the worst case scenario. So these guys who are through the roof, great when it's dry, they need all that extra skill to do it because on the day, everything's everything's like 10 times harder. If someone gets injured, do you try and make sure that 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 shot is worthy of, of ending up in the final product? You know, because they went out of their way. I mean, they got hurt, but I imagine it's a question of did we get it? You know? Yeah, yeah. The, the 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 stunt guy would would certainly want it to be there because he or she couldn't do it again, and they would at least if they got hurt, they they would want it to want it to be there. Yeah, yeah. The, the other the other problem is um, when, when things are when people get hurt and it looks nasty, then uh, a coordinator might want to put that in for for like a, to win an award. You know, like <laughs> oh god, that's gnarly. But then but then you don't want to be using you know stunt people breaking their legs. Yeah. To to. Uh, to win you awards. And that's right. also one of the reasons why apparently they never had stunt awards because they didn't want, uh, you know, stunt coordinators An injury competition to be, to be, to be, yeah, pushing the envelope with these poor people. And because they pushed the envelope enough uh, and to be in, you know, injuring these guys just so you can put on a tuxedo and go on, on TV and hold up a, a, a little uh, trophy. But uh, right. uh, hopefully we would be responsible enough that we wouldn't do that. When I was right. at PropWorks, uh, we sold 50 of those Jaffa costumes. And yeah. it, I don't know if people realize how complicated those darn things are. The number of pieces that are involved, oh. the 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 amount of Velcro that you have to count on to like keep the, the buckle on the front in place from the belt. You've got all these different sizes of guys, and not all of them are going to fit exactly right. I, yeah. Did you have pieces falling off all the time? They they did, but I want to tell you about this guy. He's a stunt uh, performer and stunt coordinator named Scott Nicholson. He he did a, he was a Jaffa a bunch of times, and he was a stunt actor one time. Uh, but uh, but he he did not want to put the Jaffa suit on because they're incredibly incredibly uncomfortable. Yeah, and so he sat in his 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 stunt room with his shirt off, and he looked good. He had 0.03% body fat. He was a, a bodybuilder and he looked good with a shirt off. But the thing was, we wanted him with his Jaffa suit on. So he yeah. said, I'll be there for you uh, on the day, but I just don't want to put the crap on now. But then it, it took two wardrobe people to put it on. So then we had Jason uh, uh, Calder, who was uh, uh, Daniel's uh, stand-in. And uh, we, we threw all the Jaffa stuff on him and we put him up this tower uh, uh, while the stunt guy was in his room, nice and warm. And uh, uh, I remember the, the the reason we had a, a stunt person up there because there was supposed to be squibs and stuff and going on. He was supposed to be, you know, up there looking handsome, blue eyes, square <laughs> jaw, holding on to this big gun. And, uh, but Twitchy Calder was up there in the, pal he would stand in for, for the shanks and then he would go up just in the background. Uh, Martin would say, "Can you? Would you mind just going up there, Twitchy, in the back and put throw an old Jaffa, a wet Jaffa suit on?" And that someone else was just wearing a smelly wet old Jaffa. So he'd go up there just on an extras voucher, which is like the tenth of the money that the stunt guy was making on a stunt wow. uh, performer's contract in his warm room. And uh, uh, so, uh, so this went on for like three days. And and so the stunt guy was getting paid like a contract and a half to be sitting in his room. And now it was time to bring in uh, the Jaffa, stunt the tower Jaffa. So we went up there and he was all shiny and sparkly. And the, all the wardrobe people were put on, took uh, 20 minutes to put all that, just like you said, all the Velcro straps and they spritzed him. And he did his shot, his little close up shot. And then it came time to blow it up. And they said, OK, let's get everybody out of there. And I'm like, what? I thought, what do you mean? Well, then Ray said, well, we've got depth car. We're going to blow the hell out of this thing. I thought it was just going to be squibs. So that, that's the reason we had the guy. So then we got everybody, including the stunt Jaffa guy, out of there. So he, so, so then they put a dummy up there, and they blew the hell out of the tower and the dummy. So yeah, this is into the fire there. with the uh, when Tilk and and, and Hammond are flying over, and they they blew the hell out of this that, thing. Yeah, that's 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 the one. That's the one. Yeah. So so then we we I had this guy there, and I did couldn't tell the producers, but we had budgeted for him for four days, a contract and a half, and then we didn't even use them. We used the dummy, and 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 then uh, the sci-fi uh, uh, magazine came out. I forget what it was called, but in the centerfold of what that episode, there he was. The, what I call Tower Jaffa up there 
uh, for his huge close-up. He looked incredibly impressive. And that was the only time he was up there. He was up there for like seven minutes for his close-up. And, 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 and the shots of him like scanning around with the, yeah. That's right. That's right. And wow. he, he got the, he got the the big close up for the for the for the show, and he got the big close up for the magazine, and he was only there for like seven minutes. Well, at least you know you guys ensured that he was going to survive by using a dummy instead. He, so, he did survive. Geez. He did survive. Would ep- one episode after another be? Tr- would would they try to, or would you ask the 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 stunt the episodes that were stunt heavy? to be followed by an episode that was not stunt heavy so that you could, I would imagine at a certain point you, you would have certain stunt people in one episode. Can you necessarily have those people in the next one in the event that they get injured or did you have to like space? Well, I, I could never, I could never request that. That would be way okay. beyond my pay scale. I wouldn't okay. have the audacity to say, Oh yeah, we're busy on this episode. It's stunt heavy. Can the next one be light? Okay. It, sometimes it's sort of wound up that way. But I would never say that because then you know, they might they might replace me. But who this yeah. guy? Well, you can't. Listen. But also then they might say, well, maybe we need a another coordinator. So we'll have okay. two. And I'm like, uh, uh, maybe this guy would be cooler than me. No, it's fine. Well, I'll, I'll do it. I'll you know, and, and then I'll get my guy who's not going to stab me in the back, right? Uh, to to do the net. But yeah, your question that that is totally. Uh, uh, the thing we you, you never wanted back to back heavy because because then again you're prepping and, and shooting and you get that overlap right. thing and then you, you may miss seven. something in the next one because you're so busy on this one. Yeah, but then you could just get someone to cover for you. You you could get another coordinator to cover. It, you know it, it would be fine. But yeah, you're right. My my ideal scenario was heavy light, heavy light. But I would never have the audacity to say, hey, producer guys, would you yeah. mind not having, you know, that would be too much. No, no, I I, I phrased it poorly, but I mean, it's it's no. interesting because you have to, you have to, sometimes you just have to step up and deal with yeah. more on your plate this season yeah. than the next season. Or, you know, this Correct. season really, really this season's episodes didn't have a lot of stunts. I mean, they they were more this type of show or that, or man, this season, it's twice as much as last season, you know? I mean, yeah. you probably yeah. look at the end of the season and go, well, this compare it to th- compared to this, this was kind of this kind of season. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, it's kind of fun too to go and do other shows. Like it's great to have yeah. your own game. And, and but I remember I did a show called Paycheck with uh, Ben Affleck. Yep. They were shooting at the uh, Vancouver Film Studios across the street from the bridge, and um, I was on. I think I was the only human ever in the history of showbiz to be on camera on two different shows on the same day. Like no actor would dare that like you couldn't, you just couldn't do it. Their agent wouldn't, well, sorry, we, or they, they would change the schedule for them, but they would never change the schedule for me. So they, uh, they, the, they wrote me a Siler thing and I, and I couldn't, I wouldn't, dare, but, but I was doing paycheck. I started doing paycheck when we had our Stargate hiatus. Uh, mm. And, and then the, it overlapped as features are want to do. It went three or four more days. And then they, they they threw me in for a siler and I didn't dare say, oh, I'm not available. Because then they say, oh, really? Oh, you, you're a big shot all of a sudden. We won't put any more silers in there. So <laughs> I said I was available. So I showed up at the Vancouver Film Studios and I put on my security uh, outfit get thing, uh, jumpsuit. And the girl combed my hair to the side. And the day before my head had come off and it annoyed her. So this time she put on a ton of hairspray to make sure the hair was, was, was not going to be flying all over the place. So I went to the to Dan, the third AD, and said, hey, Dan, do you think you'd be needing me for the next seven hours? And he said, no. So I ran across the street in that wardrobe to my room at uh, the Stargate thing, took off that jumpsuit, put on my side of the blue jumpsuit, went went to the works there. Patrick Hare said, how come your hair's like that? So he sprayed my hair, took all the grease out, combed it on the other side. <laughs> and then I went and I did uh, uh, the, the, the principal cast. They, they did all, And I was off camera being Siler. And I was crapping my pants because I thought a lot of times they they hold my part. They don't even bother turning around for Siler. They'll just let him, we'll leave him for later, which is yeah. good. Because then I could get overtime. I'd be there all day But yeah. for, 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 for one line. But today I did not want to be there. I wanted to get the heck out of there and get back to my gig across the street. And luckily, they turned around and they were sitting up for my close-up. And then all of a sudden I got a, a call on my phone saying, hey, it's Dan. And I'm like, Oops. I'm going to be so totally fired from one of these shows. It turns out it wasn't Dan, the AD from Paycheck, telling me to come back. We need you. It was Dan, stunt guy, saying, hey, I'm available for work if you need me. Oh. So 
So luckily I hung up, I did my line and I took off my, my jumpsuit from Stargate. I ran across the street with my other jumpsuit and I showed up back on set for a paycheck and nobody had moved. They're all doing their crossword. Wow. Narcolepsy had set in. And then the hair person looked at me <laughs> and saw that my hair was combed on the other side. And she said, what the hell? And she said, get back in that room. And then she uh, went through it again, this time with a with a metal brush. And then she made <laughs> sure that, really that enjoy I, had it. Little, I had little trickles of blood coming down the back of my neck. You were really my bleeding? Hair up and, what's that? You were really bleeding? I was sort of, I, I might be exaggerating slightly just okay. in the story. But she was but irritated she was, is the point. She was, she was okay. irritated and she, you know, the Corella de Ville with, uh, with the hair. She, you know, <laughs> they, they, or, or, or was it Cinderella? There's some story where they comb their hair really rough. <laughs> right. Or maybe it was uh, uh, the Brady Bunch. I'm not sure. Somebody, somebody was combing hair rough. That's, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you get uh, two days of pay and one without losing your job. Pray. No, I got more than two. I got three because I was wow. also a stunt coordinator. Uh, uh, okay. So it was a triple dip. But the thing is, you don't dare. See, you can do that if you're the coordinator because you're not on camera. So right. if, if things go sideways, you can get someone to cover for you if right. you have to be uh, on camera as a stunt performer. The, 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 the thing about this, which I should never have done, but I'm just so greedy and so irresponsible and, and someone you should never hire because now you know what I'm actually like. I was on camera for two TV shows at the same time across the street from one another. And somehow it, it, I, I made it, ha well, I, I didn't make anything happen. The, the, the will of somebody at a higher place made the, 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 the universe uh, come together to allow come it to together. Happen. When come you together. are going through a script at you, you, you go ahead, you go and highlight the parts um, that are going to be stunt heavy. Um, or involve anything with you. Have you ever had an oh crap moment where, or like like a, a couple of days late, you missed one? Like I'm, you're sitting there telling, you're talking about, oh, we go through, we highlight, we highlight. And, and all I'm thinking of is, oh my gosh, if I were tasked to do that, at some point I would overlook something. And not like you'd get to set and it'd need to be, ha there's, there's a whole process that you have to go through. But where I, a little bit further into the process, you realized that you missed something that needed to be done and you had to bust your ass to make sure that it got done. No, I thank you. That's see, that's too scary for me. Like, the, the, like, let's just say your our locations were so far away from humanity. If you needed like a bunch of porta pits to come out there for people to fall on, it would take three hours for it to happen and you would be so totally fired. So I was so petrified of, of something like that. I never, I never forgot stuff. Now they would change things. Right. And they and would add different. stuff. And even then you're expected to have that on your truck. And you know, that that's, that's what, that's the joke with uh, like with the effects people in different, different departments. They say this with this director, I got to bring my whole truck because he or she will yeah. deviate from the, from the script, not from the script, from, from prep. And, and a lot of times they'll make you look bad. They'll say, uh, oh, so we're going to ratchet that guy into the tree. And I'm like, uh, huh, sorry. No, we, no, we're, I don't think we're going to do that. So, oh, we, we discussed that. Did we not? Well, and, and you don't want to say no either. Cause then you're making the director look bad. And that's another way where you can get so totally fired. So a lot of times you, you got to eat crap, but luckily because on, on a show like Stargate, it was so big. Everybody had all the stuff there anyway. So we probably could have hooked somebody up to something and, and yanked them. And I would have had pads there and it, but yeah, that, that I would never, I could never forget because it's too, the, the, uh, the outcome and the repercussions would have been so scary. Wow. Uh, I couldn't, couldn't have lived, but, but we did de deviate and they did expect us to uh, read their minds, read their minds. Yeah. Exactly. So I guess, I guess the point is, you know, you, you bring uh, the kitchen sink in terms of your supplies in terms of, yeah. uh, if you're going so remote, like out into the GVRD yeah. or some of these other places, Correct. and you know, if it's, you've a, big, if it's ready. a big show, if it's, if it's a small show, no, then they they don't they don't expect you, you know, they don't have any dough, and and we we you know the guy's supposed to fall over, so you have a pad. End of story. You you, you know, but big shows, yeah, you got to be ready. There was an episode called Forever in a Day in season three, and it opens up with uh, 
Rob Fournier on the back of uh, the mouth that has been rigged with, I think it was a, it was a, it was a very large submachine gun, and the Jaffa are just coming over the hill, and yeah. he's mowing them down. Yes. How do you coordinate to make sure that these guys don't fall all over each other? I mean, well, yeah, like they, I mean, I mean it, it was like a free for all this shot, and eventually yeah, Jack gets you, on it and takes over. Yeah, well, you can't really because they're they're a bunch of stunt jabal coming over and they're they're rolling down sand, and the odd time you do get kicked in the chops. Wow. Uh, I remember this one girl who I had doubling Amanda. Uh, where there was another thing, not that same one. We had another one where we we're rolling down a hill where that big creature was pulling everybody. The Unas. Behind. Yeah, that's uh, Unas. Yeah, yeah, Unas. that's uh, and, demons. And they yes. all roll, yeah, they all rolled down that hill and a couple of them got kicked in the chops. But the thing was that you're talking about Fournier. That was, I re I'll, I'll remember that forever because we had to put some gel on him because he got hot. He was up there and there was a, there was an explosion on him. And I think we yanked him back. Yes, you did. Uh, and uh, a, he, there was a big explosion. We had to put a bunch of fire retardant gel on him. But that was like the, uh, I think that was a 35K that he was uh, shooting. And and I and that was Peter DeLuise's episode. And it wasn't a million Jaffa. Peter DeLuise did the, the duplication thing. Okay, had, digitally like, post and oh, inserted them in I think post. We had like seven or eight of them. Yeah. And then they would be in a row and then they could duplicate that row. 10 or 20 times and then we we could make 50 out of eight or something or out of 10 which which actually now that i think about it is one of the scary things that they're on strike for with ai yes that they can basically create everything without using any humans yep they'll take and a digital uh image of them and and uh use them in perpetuity that's what amptp suggested earlier on and uh and it was very much like not no but hell no so yeah. we well, got to be on good. guard for things like that because, you know, you can't pay a person one day and then expect them to just, okay, thanks. Thanks for, for the that one of day of season. pay. We've, we've got you now uh, for good. For no, that's wild. Yeah, that's, that's not good. And it yeah. started on Stargate with, with crowd trial, crowd duplication. It's Peter DeLuise's fault. That's the reason we're straight. <laughs> and the crowd Unas dude. in, in um, I think it was Orpheus in in. No, not Orpheus. It was Enemy Mine in season seven. You had the row of Unas going all the way down. And, you know, it was this the same pack again and again and again. And it just duplicated the Unas to make them look like a whole village. We had the uh, the first, uh, we had the L.A. Unas. I think his name was Vince. He's like six foot eight. And he was a, a specialist in being creatures. And then we wound up using a guy in town for some reason. And he, he was a big guy, but he hadn't done that kind of stuff before. Mm. And he got super, super hot. Like this, the Unis costume is layer yeah. upon layer upon layer of latex. Yeah. And, and he, you know, there's heat could not escape anywhere. And we had this Unis guy running up at the GVRD in the heat. Yep. And, and we had to wind up taking him to emergency because he got so hot. So then they had to modify the um, costume and they had stuff and, and they changed it for other yeah. costumes for other shows also, like the Incredible Hulk. And the thing from Fantastic Four, they had little things pumped in. Uh, I think it was water or something to cool them off. Mm -hmm. And 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 we could also only let him work for like twenty minutes at a time. We had to take his head off and cool him down. This is it, wild. Yeah, you can um, it, you can suffocate in your own heat. Yeah, so. it, the, the heat is through the roof, through the roof. Oh, and I did a thing. Oh, it was like the toughest day I ever had. I was, uh, uh, what was the name of the show? Hopefully they'll pop into my brain as I'm uh, talking, but we were all these, we were like, we were like super soldiers from Stargate, but it was a different show. And also we were running around the same way. And you just like, after a while, you're like so dizzy. And, and then, they, then, then they put in the, the uh, contact lenses in your eyes and you can't see where uh. you're going and you're tripping. Oh, and speaking of contact lens, I want to go back to a Stargate episode where, the, we were in a concept meeting and the producer said, um, oh, we have to put these contacts in these guys. And, and they weren't Jaffa, but they were older uh, uh, whatever guys. And they said they're going to have a hard time seeing with his contacts. Should they be stunt people? And actually, I said, yes, because half the time they're saying we don't want to pay stunt people. And, and this time they're saying, should they be stunt people? And I Are said, you talking oh, yeah, about the priors in seasons nine and ten? Yeah. The, yeah. So, the, yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so these guys. Uh, we we they went through and they they got the prosthetic done, 
and it was very, really expensive and looked really, really cool. And, and, and they brought in a PA for each of these three people to carry to take them by the hand, to take them everywhere because they were going to be totally blind. Wow. And so they put, the con- they put the contacts in on the day and they can see perfectly. And we're like, <laughs> we're like, holy crap, we brought in all these people. If the, if the producers find out that they can see perfectly, we're going to be in trouble. And and, 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 a, and a lot of times I was in a show called, um, oh, I was Pa Buckner in Cabin in the Woods. And I, uh, yeah. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't see at all, but that's a totally different story. Good movie but though, so now, Dan. So, yeah, yeah so, so now they can see perfectly, but we... We have a PA taking them by the hand everywhere, and they have just to pretend. pretend to, they have to pretend to be blind for four days. <laughs> and, 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 and so, Jason, so Jason Twitchy Calder, who doubled the Shanks, was hilarious, and so he he was pretending to bump into the thing, all, all <laughs> bumping into the wall and bumping into the doors, and and you know uh, going over the top with it. And uh, oh, that's too bump, funny. You know, yeah, and and so that's but, but if I can do a quick cabinet whistle, yeah, was, please. Paul Buckner, uh, five hours of effects makeup, and uh, putting a bunch of glue around your eyes to you know to, so so the the you wouldn't see the space and and so and my gag the gag was that I was in the back. In fact, Dan Payne played my son, uh, and he was a huge. He was another uh, one of those guys, uh, zombie, and the, the story point was that he took an axe. And cut my uh, j- my jaw and had a big slice. So in, in the prosthetic, I had my thin full back like this, and so I was I was always uh, like when when they did the prosthetic in L.A., they, they said, "Are you claustrophobic?" I said, "No, no, no problem." Because they said we had a stunt guy in here a couple of days ago, and he freaked out when we did this, and we had to bring in his wife and they had to hold his hand while we did it. And, I, and I'm like, "No wives are going to be holding my hands." I so so <laughs> we we put the stuff on. And then pulled the thing back, but I got a little bit of saliva kind of coming down, and I'm, I'm trying to swallow to breathe and to, and, and and as they put more cement on, all of a sudden I I can't hear them anymore because they're further further away, and it's getting harder and harder. And I'm thinking, like I'm having a hard time breathing because the because the little drips of saliva, and I have to let it I have to let it pool and build up. And then I got to take a, a swallow, swallow it, yeah, and hope I don't choke. And I got I got to do that every like minute and a half because it keeps building up. Oh. So so now we, we got this. So now we're back. We're on the day we're working. And my gag was that the the Winnebago went into the water, and now we're we're in the water, and the the zombie who's already dead somehow drowned. So we're we have this uh, uh, stunt girl named uh, Maya who who's on top of the um, uh, of the, the 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 Winnebago with the sunroof, and so. I cannot get a regulator in my mouth because I've got the fangs and I got the thing full of that. So the the diver guys mocked up a uh, uh, it was like a welder's mask where I had to hold it against my face, it, and and he had to take me and I'm blind right I'm totally blind underwater and I trained for a month to get used to being blind underwater because you just you, know, you just yeah you, you just freak, freak out. out. So they bring me down 25 feet and they're holding on to me and I'm blind and I'm I'm holding it pressing this thing and little b- bits of water kind of, you know, cause you dripping in cause you can't get a seal. And then they put me into the Winnebago and they close the door. And, and, and then they, then I hear the loudspeaker. Okay. Take away the mask. So I take off the mask and I'm holding my breath. And then Maya puts her leg down through the sunroof and they say action. And she starts kicking me in the head, kicking me in the head. And I'm like the zombie Pa Buckner guy holding my breath until I couldn't anymore. And then I, I, I don't know which way is up and which way is down, but I, I feel where the console is. And I push my feet off the console to the back of the Winnebago, which is open. And two scuba divers each take my wrist and take me 20 feet up to the surface so I can breathe. Cause, cause if I would have panicked or if I would have, you know, thought, well, well, that way is up and that way is down. They couldn't have forced a regulator in my mouth. Like you do underwater in panic right. situation. And so, so that was the freakiest gag. I'd, I'd ever done uh, oh, being blind underwater. And that was for Cabin in the Woods. I'm sure Joss Whedon appreciated it. Man, oh he's man. a great, he was a great guy. And uh, who's the director? Uh, oh, he was nice Joss, too. Was and then, jo- I think it was Joss Whedon. No, no, Josh direct. He wrote it and he directed the second unit. It was. Um, oh, it uh, was Drew Goddard. Or, Drew Goddard. Yeah. Drew And Drew Goddard did, did Martian too. A few uh, years. He, okay. he wrote Martian. Uh, with, That's um, right. Uh, 
yeah he, so yeah that was that that was a group good group of humans uh there yeah for that you you still got some time yeah i've got some fan questions for you okay good yeah elizabeth lee did you find your wrench did i ever find the wrench elizabeth yes it was did, did, it did was the, in the basement last time it, it was did, does elizabeth have a visual can she see she me? can okay so elizabeth here's the answer to your question <laughs> I found the wrench. The wrench was downstairs. Uh, in fact, I brought the wrench. We had a Stargate convention here in September, and I brought the wrench out with me. And I also brought my daughter, Steffi, who's actually a, a, a doctor now. She's a GP. She starts uh, over on Vancouver Island. In, good for in her. A week. It, it, she played Solen yep. in Learning Curve as an 11 year old. So we got a bunch of pictures made up. And then she came along to the convention in September and uh, we were on stage to get kind of cool being on stage with your daughter. And it was, a, I, I suspect a little, little bit cool for the fans also to see an 11 year old. Now she's grown up and, and they can ask questions about uh, being Solen and, and what, what was it like having a jerk, uh, like a, a stunt coordinator for a dad. And uh, <laughs> she could rat me out in front of the, all the fans. And uh, so that was that was kind of cool. And then we had Johnny Elmer, who doubled Chris Judge, and he also played a fireman, firefighter, one of the episodes. So he got some yes, the changeling findings and stuff. And then uh, everybody wound up getting COVID. Oh, geez. Everybody, everybody except me. My daughter, who was uh, uh, an intern over on Vancouver Island, couldn't work for two weeks. Man, was she pissed off? <laughs> you know, uh, wow. I said, "Steady, come over, come over for the convention. We'll have fun." And uh, so now she's out of, out of work and she, you know, she's a health person. She is yeah. they're not, supposed to be, they're not supposed to be spreading COVID to people. And, uh, but I, I was the only guy who didn't get it. Wow. But, uh, yeah. I, yeah. we had a similar situation, GateCon uh, 2020, where, I mean, a uh, number of the people who were around me and, and wearing masks and everything else, they, they went home with, with COVID and I've, still never had it so wow. i mean we've all had yeah. it you know but i've never manifested symptoms so yeah. it's like and i don't really take and, care of myself so why me you know yeah and that was the first time where i was around humans like i yeah. I, I was never petrified of covid uh Same. from a health standpoint i was right. more maybe i was an idiot but i was more concerned about the, the money i lost because yeah. i wasn't working and i maybe i should have been worried about like i was worried about I was, I appreciate other people. I mean, people died. And of people course. Whatever. Yeah. But, but, but I still. personally, I, I thought, it, I just thought it would bounce off me or I, I didn't, I didn't really, I didn't really uh, care as much for me, but uh, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't it's know what wild. I, uh, I have a question about, um, about the girls. Um, Lock Watcher says both of your daughters have done stunt work as well as acting. Um, how has it been to work with them and uh, did was it like a foregone conclusion that that's something that they would do at some point because you well, were involved they, in that? They did it. So, so I have two daughters, Stephanie and Joey. Yeah. So Stephanie did stunts and she did a little bit of acting and then uh, on Stargate. And, and then she did it. I did a series called Psych for eight seasons. They both did a bunch of stuff on there. That was a comedy. And they, they got to help pay for college. And then uh, and then uh, Joey was three years younger. She she played she uh, she was on a, a highly rated episode of X-Files where she played um, Sully as an eight year old in a flashback where she has a uh, she wants to have a baby or something. But her, her brother steals her rabbit and kills her rabbit and the rabbit's full of maggots. My daughter Joey is uh, is Scully as an eight year old has to react to the rabbit. And then another woman is in a in a church and she's in a casket, but she apparently she got drowned and that's how she died. But then the, the actress in the casket, now there was a flashback of her being underwater. Wow. And my daughter Joey had to react. So she, Joey was a quite a good actress and, and, and she was more show busy than Steph, but they both basically, Joey was a bit too young for Stargate, although she did do a scene where she was hanging up somewhere. Fragile balance people. for the Asgard. Yeah. She was in the, yeah, yeah. In, she, she, the was, she was set. hanging on a wire. And then, and then, and then uh, she also did the, I think the last episode we shot with Peter Delaware, she was a little girl on a little bicycle. Affinity when around. Teal'c's living in the, in the apartments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so then, so they both did it. So now Joey has been living in the Middle East for a decade. She was in uh, Beirut, Lebanon for five years. She was in Cairo, Egypt for five years. She's fluent in Arabic. 
and she now works for the Human Rights Watch. She was also, when she was in Cairo, she was doubling one of the female leads there, one of the biggest uh, box office draws in Cairo for a couple uh-huh. of feature films. Uh, but but she said it was really sketchy. She said you make no money there, yeah, and it's real sketchy because it's like they hang you up. It's like it's not like here where everything is 100 percent safe. It was like holy crap. Yeah, but but uh, she was helping Syrian refugees. But she was on MSNBC two weeks ago doing an interview for the Live for the Saudi Arabia the golfing thing. She and and a month before that she was on the BBC uh, talking about Afghanistan refugees. So she, so that's her. And, and her boyfriend is a guy named Raf Sanchez, who's a journalist for uh, MSNBC. And he he doubled. He interviewed Netanyahu, the uh, wow. Israeli, Israeli prime guy, minister. Yeah. Two weeks ago. And so so that's wow. their thing. They're into politics now. So so both kids did show biz all the way through. But they and and they're still union members. And when they come home, I like to get them out, you know, have them fall over and make a bit of dough and, and work with them. But uh, now one's a GP and one's uh, w- works for the Human Rights uh, Watch, and she lives in uh, uh, Tel Aviv at the moment. You did well, Dan. Well, the other both, yeah, good, good girls. Dan, uh, Dan, Jim Kite uh, wants to know where did your where did you get init- your initial training to do all the various things that you've learned to do, well, or I, is it just okay? We're gonna we're gonna learn how to do this. We're gonna learn how to do this, and so on. That's kind of I'm kind of old school. I'm not the the perfect stunt person. Is uh, is like a, 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 a Olympic medalist who said, "I'm going to do stunts, and I'm going to first learn how to slide cars. I'm going to learn how to do uh, wheelies on motorcycles. They're going to, I'm going to, they're going to teach me how to do uh, 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 parkour stuff. Yeah, and I'm going to learn. I'm going to get my black belt in, in martial arts. That's what they do in England. They don't let you on set until you can do everything. Here." If you're a martial artist and we need someone to do a spinning back kick, you 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 can get hired. So then you get hired to do stunt peer person. So you're a fighter. Then you think, wow, if I if I can learn how to slide a car, then then they'll bring me out for the car stuff. So then then you you go down to LA and you take the the driving course there, the the Rick Seaman driving course. So now you're a fighter and, and now you're a driver. And then as you move along, then you well maybe I'll learn that thing. So there are some guys here and girls, you know, a small percentage who are not just proficient, but incredible, they're excellent in everything. And, um, but the most of us were kind of good in a couple of things. And then as we progressed along, uh, we would learn new things. So, so I got my black belt, it took me six years to get my black belt. And I was doing that as I was doing stunts. So, so yeah, like I'm the least talented of all. I was just a hockey player. And I was lucky because Richard Dean Anderson was a hockey player and he needed a hockey player to double for him for an episode. And that's how I got met him. And uh, uh, we 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 hit it off pretty well because, you know, uh, hockey players like hockey players. And so that and then from then on, that's when I thought, well, if, if I can learn how to fight, if I can learn how to slide cars, if I can learn how to do this, then I'll get more work. And that, that's how I did it. Wow. Which is not the preferred. That's not the preferred way. Yeah, but you can you you've obviously made a living yeah. doing it. Yes, it's, yes. The natural human instinct is to shy away from uh, uh, danger, injury. Um, are there some people who are just uh, more willing to to take uh, risk with with bodily harm, or is it something I mean, that so, you so people, that people have to desensitize but- themselves to? Well, how, well, how do you gauge that? in general are, 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 are like that. They're, they're uh, danger junkies. Like that, that's how they're wired. That's their DNA. And uh, the people that I'd mentioned who are great in all the different disciplines, they wind up getting hired a lot. And they wind mm-hmm. up doing the huge, nasty gags. But they're also the people who wind up getting hurt right. and, and getting banged up. And, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, all these all these guys who, who started who were flippity-dippity and they were... 10th degree black belts and they could set themselves on fire. But, but unfortunately they, they get banged up and then, and, and it's idiots like me that do easy stunts that, that kind of keep on crawling along and have a 30 year career. Whereas the superstars wind up getting banged up and they have to wind up being coordinated. Uh, yeah. So, but uh, yeah, I mean, generally speaking, you know, they're, 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 they're junkies. They, they, they're adrenaline junkies. 
and they love that they they just and plus the the precision of the, of being a stunt person the precision of you know they're they're doing the final finals on you but you're but you're focusing on you know I got to hit my mark and I got to do this and if I don't do that I'm going to look like an idiot and I'm going to make the coordinator look bad and, and I'm going to blow a hundred thousand dollar shot but I may also you know break my ankle so uh wow. so that so that that sense of precision and then not screwing up and then you get a little bit of applause and then you get to go for lunch and then you get paid it's a, that's a that's a fun day you talk about uh, danger junkies have you ever had to be on the lookout for or come across a situation where you have to save people from themselves like you can't yeah, do well, that you are really going to get hurt oh man i can't wait uh no 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 well that's, there was a guy uh there was a person up in, up in a place called Squamish here, which is almost at Whistler. Yeah. There's this rock rock face uh, where they wanted a guy to jump off this rock face, I guess, with, with, with one of those parachutes. And I guess the mountaineering experts said, nah, this, that's not a good idea. But but some one guy said, oh, yeah, I do that. I do that all the time. Well, well, you know, I can do that. So they they hired this guy. It wasn't my show. And he went off the cliff and he died. Like he, uh, he didn't, you know, so you as a coordinator, you can never listen to anybody. Like you can never, if anyone says they can do something, you never believe them. You only hire people who you know can do the, whatever it is that you're supposed to do. So even then there's a risk of something going wrong, but, um, uh, yeah, you, you know, that, that it doesn't happen because, they're so well trained, and you only use the people that you know to okay. do what, what they're supposed to do. Okay. So by the time you get, they get to set, they've been vetted, and you you have you yeah. have people in your network who vouch. Yeah, and and even okay. then, there's still a margin of error, right? But then, of you've, course, but you've, you've done your best, and you've you've hired the best. So liability wise, right. if something goes sideways, well, I hired the best person, right? Uh, and and also, uh, you know they have the best chance to do the best gag and to do it safely. Absolutely. General Maximus, we answered your question, but thank you. Pamela Terachek, um, th she says this This may be a stupid question. I don't think there are any stupid questions. Are stunts in a sci-fi show in any degree more complex or exciting than stunts in, in non-genre action series? Is there any kind of a technical difference or is it all of a piece? Well, it just depends specifically what the show wants. Yeah. So sci-fi tends to be uh, uh, beyond your imagination. And you, and in that sense, it could be more more dangerous and more specific because it, it doesn't have to be real. And so therefore you're like, well, how are we gonna do that? Hmm, and then you have to figure out how to do it. And then it, it could there could be more risk involved. So yeah, there might be a little bit of that in sci-fi only because uh, you're only limited by the imagination of the writer and then the ability of the, your technical people to make it a reality and money and time. Okay, absolutely. Teresa MC, did everyone uh, of the main cast have a double available? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't think Terrell, I don't think Terrell did because I don't think we ever had any stunts for Terrell Rothery. Yeah. But um, uh, uh, we, we should have had a stunt for the one time because uh, uh, Rick, Rick got really mad at this. But just speaking, of, speaking of this. <laughs> Yes, please. I was I was always as Sergeant Siler. I was always in the infirmary in bed, and um, uh, uh, Tara, old, old Doc, uh, would come over and and be checking out Siler. And then one time, uh, I wound up uh, taking the wrench and putting it under the covers. And uh, you can sort of imagine what happened when Tara started feeling around for <laughs> my injuries, and uh, and. Uh, we we thought that kind of stuff was funny back then, but when Rick found out that I'd done that, he was so pissed off at me. And of course, I mean, we we ne could never even think about doing anything like that nowadays. But so that uh, was the end of the wrench. Uh it, it might have been. Yeah, it might have been. So well, yeah. Who started this? Who, who, was it you or or Martin Wood? Who uh, started, who the, started wrench? the wrench? Or who who who? Yeah. How did that come about? Putting, putting it under the covers. No, I mean uh, in general, having you're having the. <laughs> Oh, it's so you have these complex pieces of equipment. I know on the ramp with all yeah, these and, little and pieces, this... and you have this 
Yeah. <laughs> thing. yeah. And you it, it, and Martin yeah, Glenn know. are passing it back and forth and using yeah. your... T- I mean, that's so yeah. funny, man. That yeah, is I don't funny. know if it's Mark. I think it might have been Martin or maybe Peter. But I think Martin would because just it like was. you said, it's so, it's so complicated. You're taking people to the other side of the universe, and it basically, yeah, you need a wrench, just just like we need on Earth. You all, you always just need an idiot with a wrench to to bang. Well, it's not something. like you're hitting you're, it. You're 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 tightening stuff yeah. on it. With both yeah. of you have straight faces. Yeah. <laughs> you're passing well, it the- back and forth. We're saying that something that can take you to the other side of the galaxy has a bunch of bolts and nuts and bolts in it, and that, that's how it works. Oh, I, I I just saw this thing. Maybe it was on um, was it on YouTube or or but last night about uh, the uh, time and space. Albert Einstein, how the how the universe works. It's like the Earth is like a, a ball rolling on like, like a blanket kind of thing. And they're 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 trying to figure out how to travel faster than the speed of light. And what they're apparently they're realistically trying to come up with is is not using fuel, but using a way that you can attach onto parts of the universe and have it roll you along, uh, uh, like like faster than the speed of wow. light. Like 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 as opposed to propelling you. Yeah. You're somehow using the time and space mm-hmm. itself to bend. To, to pull you along and yeah. and apparently they're that's real and they're actually looking into that now whether it'll ever materialize is i think I mean? if we can if we can get um out of our own way you know with one another i think yeah the, we'll we'll find a way to to bend einstein's laws and make it work so yeah, yeah that's really cool though so so yeah, yeah so um but who first introduced this wrench? And what kind of what size of a wrench is it? And who first introduced it? What was what was the genesis of that? You know what? I I, I don't even know if I know that. I I, wow. I think that was a Martin Wood thing. He thought it was funny to have this this uh, this stupid wrench. <laughs> but I think it was Martin. Just just uh, they gave it to me one day, um, <laughs> to give me some some business. Give yeah. me, you know, people smoke on camera, and some people need. Uh, Oh, what's his name? No, what's his name? Loved sipping his tea. I think the, the, sorry, who's the guy who replaced Shanks for a couple of yeah, episodes? Yeah, uh, Corin Nemec, Jonas Quinn. Yeah, Corin. He, he he loved having a tea bag. Yeah, uh, that was that was his shtick. And, and so Jack's wanted... Ricks was taking stuff out of the the cups too. So oh, was it? Uh huh. Yeah. So he would see yeah. things swimming around. You go back and watch that show. There's four or five instances where he's you know he's finding something swimming and he. It pulls it in, and he's throwing it away. Is that, uh, is that Rick or Rick or that's Corin? that's Rick? Oh. Yeah, but Corin had a, a mug in his first episode, and yeah. this, the legend is uh, Rick came along and said, "That's my thing." So uh, then Corin went to fruit. So yeah, yeah, I know that. I know it didn't last long. I I thought it was because the producers didn't like it. Like, what the hell is he doing with this color? But maybe you're probably right. What what point did uh, did the embossing on the side of the wrench was that during the show that you guys had that done or have you done that since the Siler the, the Sly, Sly Siler's steel when was that oh added? they did that for me they that was like a gift I think that was a gift from Martin and <laughs> in fact I just took a picture of myself with the wrench and I'm going to send it to Martin after I'm done here to let them know I just did this and and to let him know that the wrench is still around absolutely. Uh, and yeah. let him know I say hello and that uh, I'm looking forward indeed, to him yeah. coming back on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. This is good stuff, man. Um, uh, okay, we've got a couple more here and then uh, yeah. we're, we're wrapping it up. Um, th- Dan Ben, these days, uh, have you ever watched one of uh, the shows you've worked on and noticed things that you wanted to fix, like visible equipment or safety mats or, oh, gosh, I wish I had seen that then? Or do you ever go back? Do you not go back and watch? No, you, I, no, I, I do watch it, but I remember um, I was hearing like Quentin Tarantino interviewed uh, a couple nights ago, and he was saying he he would like to go back and redo Reservoir Dogs because now he's so skilled he can make it mm. make it better. And I hear that from directors; they sort of wince, and I hear it from actors because I, you know. But for me, no, I we just uh, we did the best we could do mm. at the time, and for episodic, you're kind of not rushing but you're moving along pretty quickly you prep and shoot and prep and shoot like features they have forever to set up stuff but no i don't i don't uh i I don't do that i i i when i watch it i always remember what was happening behind the scenes Mm. 
I remember hearing that uh, an actor's talking ab about that on a talk show saying how the, 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 the fans remember what they see on camera and the actors and stunt people working on it remember what was happening behind the scenes at the time. Right. You always remember you all, it's just a totally different perception. Yeah. And you, you always remember what was actually happening behind the camera while the camera was rolling. And so, um, and no, I, no, I, I, I don't, uh, uh, no, I, I that that's not a thing that I, I do. I just I appreciate watching because because mm -hmm. a lot of times I remember well, that well, that was a day that you know uh, we 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 got got in trouble for um, for laughing or, or or someone's phone went off one time. Um, my uh, the the one when cell phones started in the beginning, people's phones were going off and they hadn't invented or maybe they did invent but uh, you know the uh, silent either, switch. Yeah. yeah. And finally, after a little bit of time, they said, if anyone's phone goes off, like you're fired. That's the end of it. So wow. um, I remember I was uh, I always had my phone on silent all. I never turned. And for some reason, the night before, Vinny, one of the uh, ADs had called me and I, I didn't get the I didn't get the call. So I, I turned on my phone so I could hear the ring if someone was going to call me. And so the next day it was Rick's close up. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, the close up and Richard Dean Anderson, all of a sudden, we heard ding ding, and I'm like, I'm like, God, what idiots going to get fired because their phone is on? I think, and then all of a sudden, this ding ding. And then I think, well, you think when the phone rang once, this moron would have shut it off? And, and, I, and then I looked down, I saw a red light going off on my phone, and then I heard it go ding ding. And I thought, well, I'm the moron, so I had to shut it off. And then, uh, was, then we cut, and of course, Rick wanted to know who it was. And uh, but because I was his buddy, they, they didn't want to fire me. So uh, what, what happened was uh, about two months later, there was a close up on Siler and uh, I was do, supposed to do my line. A lot of so, sometimes they wouldn't be there. They, they you know, they'd be like an, an ex because that's Rick. You know, that's Judge. That's Amanda. And I just you didn't need them there because I just had to say one line. Right. But on this day, they were all there. For my one line and i think oh that that's nice well, maybe they think i'm a, a real actor now i'm gonna you know they're respecting me i'm one of them now this is great and so it, it was they said action brad turner was the director and they said action and, and i was oh, i was about to say my line all of a sudden i heard ding ding and then i then i realized what was happening rick had remembered this from months earlier and he was waiting for my close-up to ring his phone on purpose and all the actors knew that this was going to happen and that's the reason they were there because they wanted to be in on the fun but i knew that because like i'm more of a jerk and i'm more sarcastic that i i couldn't fall apart like i had to stay there and so i, I couldn't i couldn't laugh i couldn't do anything and, and so then i then brad was like action so then i would try to say my line again and then i was gonna be ding ding it was and i had payback buddy kind of, Little little bead of sweat kind of coming down like this, thinking. But I, I wasn't gonna let Rick break me. I had to I had to hang in, and finally he stopped ringing, and I said my line. But the 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 thing was, there was an older actor. It was his close up next, and he was an LA guy. They flew him up for his close up, and he came up to me and he said, "Do, do they always do that on your close ups?" Like <laughs> he was. He was petrified that someone was going to be ringing a cowbell or, or you know, like when you're taking a foul shot in basketball, holding up a bunch of signs to distract you for his close up. And I said, no, no, that was just, uh, just because he was getting back at me for something. That's for exactly right. And that yeah. was uh, the actor uh, who played Daniel Jackson's grandfather in yeah, the episode yeah. Crystal Skull, directed by Brad Turner. <laughs> yeah. And one of my favorite lines in that entire episode. And it's interesting that you bring this up was you were opposite Jason Shambing in one scene where he's trying to determine yep. what the crystal skull is. And he looks to you and yep. he says, what do you think? And you say to him, I think you're going to get fired. Ah, yeah. <laughs> and here here you're we go. Getting that same episode. You're getting payback for Poor what? <laughs> oh, geez. That's funny. Oh, yeah. gosh. Dan, um, thank you so much uh, uh, for coming on. Uh, it really means um, a lot to, for me to have you. And um, uh, I, I'm glad that you're you're continuing to work. It's up in the air for so many folks right now. You yeah, know? So, it's nasty. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on, sir. Yeah, and uh, and plus we 
I can always fall back in the gay porn. I did that back in the seventies. So that, you know, there's, cause now there are like, options. Yeah. 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 Porn for old people is very popular now. So it may be, maybe an option. So just, you know, keep, keep a lookout for me. Absolutely. Oh, one last question. The drag, the dragon AF one. Do you think Siler is, uh, is actually in Jack's will? Uh, no chance. <laughs> In fact, he would he would he would try to kill me. So you know, so no, I, I wouldn't be in the will. Oh, it's funny. He he he'd be the guy responsible for my death. But at least they both love The Simpsons. So exactly. There you go, Dan Che, stunt coordinator, uh, and uh, Rick's photo double and Siler. No stunt double. Stunt double. Rick's double. stunt double. My apologies. I started sir. off as a photo double back in MacGyver. Uh, okay, I got that mixed up. And uh, okay. Sergeant Siler on Stargate SG One, sir. Thank you so thank much you, for thank joining. Thank you, David me. Reed. Bye-bye. Be well. And thank you, guys. Nice talking to you. Bye-bye. Dan Shea. Great guy. Love having him on. Hope you enjoyed that one. He is a walking wealth of uh, knowledge. Uh, Really appreciate uh, you all tuning in. This was a great show. And uh, we've got another one heading your way uh, in, uh, if if everything remains on schedule here, Richard Hudolin, the first... Uh, production designer for Stargate SG-1 uh, for the first five seasons. He's going to be joining us on Friday, um, and I'm going to be talking with him momentarily here. Uh, it's going to be a pre-recorded show, but uh, we're going to we're gonna keep on sending you a few more as we move forward here. Thanks so much to Summer and Anthony uh, for uh, moderating this uh, particular episode. My continued to thanks, thanks to all of my moderators, Tracy, uh, Jeremy, and Reese. Uh, Frederick Marcou at Concepts Web, who keeps Dialthegate.com up and running. Really appreciate you, sir. And my producer, Linda Gate Gabber Fury. She's going to be coming back on in the next couple of weeks here. We've got uh, some more content uh, heading your way here as we uh, move into fall. Everyone's asking me, how much longer are you going to go? How long is season three going to last? I don't know. How long are the strikes going to last? And, you know, so many of these uh, uh, behind the camera personnel are available to talk. And we're going to talk to them for uh, as long as we can and as uh, many as uh, who want to to come on the show. I've been really lucky. I can't believe we've got Richard. That's Bridget McGuire all over. Thanks so much to her. My name is David Reed for Dial the Gate. I really appreciate you tuning in. We'll see you on the other side.